Well, welcome and thanks for being here. Um, in our class, these are mostly entrepreneur and business students. So. This is my class. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first road game. I'm re really nervous. Um, we've talked about what it takes to start a business and uh, what it takes to lead a team tonight. Um, but what do you want to know about running the show, where you're ultimately responsible for success or failure of the venture? So tonight our topic is leadership, how to unify, inspire, and guide a team or a company to greatness. Uh, our guest is one of the more visible and successful leaders in the country, regardless of, of uh, occupation or business. He's taken a, an organization <coughs> that was in chaos at the time and basically turned Tell it around. Tell us how bad it was. I will, <laughs> we're going to go to all of that, trust me. Uh, some of us who uh, are a little bit older remember those times and they hurt. Um, but obviously, he's not a CEO, he's not an entrepreneur, but he'd be a hell of a good one if he were. I can trust that all these things that he does at USC would be directly translatable to a company. So how many recent Trojan fans, last five or six years, undergrads, how, how many of you have been following USC football for less than 10 years? You have no idea <laughs> how spoiled and lucky you are. It's not even real what you're experiencing right now, or as he would say it is. So let's give you some perspective. In the five years before Mr. Carroll arrived. USC was 31 and 29. They qualified for exactly one bowl, the Sun Bowl, which they lost to perennial power TCU. <laughs> That's the before, here's the after. In the last seven years, his teams have gone a ridiculous 82 and nine. Yeah. Oh, is this on? I said 82 and nine. <laughs> They won 34 straight at one point. They've gone 14 and two against traditional rivals, Notre Dame and UCLA, including the last seven against Notre Dame. Speaking of sevens, seven straight Pac-10 titles, seven straight BCS games going six and one, winning back-to-back -back national championships in 03 and 04 and coming within 19 excruciating seconds of winning an unprecedented third yeah, national yeah, championship. Bring that up, huh? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, they were ranked number one 33 straight weeks. There are only 13 games in a year, so think about that. In three of four years, the most prestigious trophy in all of sport, the Heisman Trophy, resided here at USC on his team. The stats are goofy. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Trust me, I have. The stats are goofy. <laughs> But it's, it's obviously not the stats that everyone's talking about. It's more than wins and losses. It's an energy, an invisibility, an enthusiasm, and a way of coaching that no one can match. So we're thrilled to have you here and can't wait to talk to you about leadership and your philosophy. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Glad to have you in my classroom. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started. So you talked about you know, what it was like before, and, and so I want to understand that. These students here are about to go out in the real world. Some of them are going to start businesses. So they have to find an opportunity. So let's talk about recognizing a good opportunity, particularly in these times where opportunities aren't as apparent. Um, let's, in the 80s and 90s, before you came here, USC finished in the top 10 in those 20 years once. Notre Dame went 14-3-1 against us, winning 11 straight. 11 straight. That's a horrible thought. So are some cold trips to Chicago. Um, UCLA ran off eight consecutive. Barely above 500 during that time. You were the sixth head coach in 18 years. It was a mess here. So what did you see about the opportunity here when you came to USC and took the job? Well, I, I had grown up in California and, uh, and always had been, you know, college football fan and all that. And so I, I had seen SC through the years when they were loaded up and had great years, you know. We're going to school and finished playing in, in uh, 1972, right around, the, you know, so some really big years for SC and they were on top of everything, great players and great coaches, Coach McKay and all that. And uh, so I kind of held that in my mind as what, you know, this program kind of stood for it could be. And then all of these years passed when I was in the NFL and I kind of didn't pay a whole lot of attention. I knew it was going on, but it didn't mean much to me, you know. and. Uh, so when it came time to have an opportunity to come back, um, you know, I, 
you know, to take it back. I mean, if I'm going to go into an opportunity, I'm going to go in thinking everything good's going to happen. You know, I'm not thinking anything but that. So my mindset is already that way anyway. But I couldn't, I couldn't back off the thought of what Essie had become and, and uh, over those years and, and what it could, again, stand for <coughs> because there are some fundamental great elements of this job setup. It's, it's a private school. It's a good setting here for, you know, great coliseum to play in. It's in Los Angeles with millions of, of people to, to supply, you know, your, your, uh, your student athletes. And I mean, on and on, all of the great things, the Pac-10, good conference, and the Rose Bowl to play for. I mean, all of these wonderful aspects of it. And I just saw the good stuff. I was told time and time again by people that, you know, w w as I was preparing to take the job and took the job, it was like I was the guy getting in the barrel to go over the falls at Niagara. You know, well, good luck, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, it, it felt like that. Uh, from the outside in, and, and my thought was, well, all of that may be true. Maybe you know the, the academic standings had changed. Maybe the the shift in the Pac-10, which if you can imagine, when we got here, Washington was the winningest team in the Pac-10 in the '90s or the whatever it was sure. that year. You know, the ten years before. And I mean, think about how different that is. And and uh, and I didn't really care what anybody said. I just I, and what I said at the time, they said, well, how long is it going to take you to win and be good and all that kind of thing? Well, we'll be good when we play good, which is really what it takes. You've got to play real well, and when you do, you'll see how far you can take it. And that's what I wanted to find out. If, if things had shifted and things had changed, then we would do a great job of coaching and a great job of recruiting and counseling and doing the whole program and take it to a point where we would find <coughs> out what is our, the new level for USC um, and hoping that what had just transpired wasn't, wasn't the case. And uh, so, you know, that, that's kind of how w that mindset, you know, we went into the, the, you know, this opportunity. Well, your business is competitive. Obviously, football is very competitive. You <coughs> keep score. You have wins and losses, um, especially Division One. You're competing for recruits. You're competing for fans. You're competing for everything. Um, in business, we teach our students to find and exploit a competitive advantage, find something that can do better, faster, cheaper, that no one else can, can do. What is your and USC's competitive advantage in the marketplace of football? Well, th there's a lot of elements, like I said, that make this place up and, and that are just kind of inherent. And if you look around the country, you know, there's, there's certain schools that have an edge. Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, you know, LSU, uh, the Florida schools can have that advantage because there's just a, a, a makeup that gives them a, a better advantage than other schools. We have that. Um, and the, so that, that's the start of it. But that was there in all those other years, too. And uh, that never changed. But I think what, what happened here in, in coming in is we came in uh, with a philosophy and an approach to competing and uh, taking over and, and going at a challenge like this that was unique and that I think is still unique and, and that has separated us. You know, we have a, a, a simple mindset that, that kind of guides everything that we're about. And where you said, you know, you're going to look for your, your place to find an edge. Well, our one-liners, we're going to do things better than it's ever been done before in everything that we do. You know, that's a very, very strong affirmation statement, you know, and, and uh, it calls for only one way to go about that, and that you have to compete, and you have to have uh, a sense for competition that will allow you uh, to stay on course with that mentality, that, that, uh, that one single statement, you know, at all times, forever, and it never goes away. You don't sleep through it. It doesn't, you know, it never ends. And what that means is that we're in constant pursuit of a competitive edge in everything we're doing, a relentless pursuit, you know. And if you think that way, uh, imagine the standards that we're living up to and we hold ourselves up to. And I don't think it matters whether you're coaching football or you're running a household or you're <coughs> running a company or teaching a class. If, if you operate with that mindset and you truly can live that, that competitive mentality, then you're going to find out how good you can be. And that's, that's really something that's different about us uh, that um, uh, I think it's, it's much more than that, but that's the, the start of it all. That's where it begins. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about how you instill that in everything you do in practice and games and reviewing films, all those things. Um, when you started out, you know, you, you, you took over a program. I think you went two and five of your first seven games. At what point did you feel the things start turning. Was there a particular point or game where you just yeah, said there was really, the switch there was really switched. a play. We were playing against Arizona. I, I'm going to take you back to tell the story here. We were two and five, and we're going to Arizona to play in the desert. And uh, the Fridays before the game, we always take the team to the stadium, check out the locker room, go on the field, check out your cleats, throw the ball around a little bit, have kind of a lighthearted workout, and then get out of there and go to the hotel and get ready for the night before the game. And uh, 
<clears throat> as we ended up the week, we weren't playing very well. Carson Palmer was the quarterback. You know, he was struggling. And every, you know, we just weren't doing well. And uh, myself included with the other coaches thought that maybe it was time to change the quarterback. You know, maybe that was the issue. Now, this <coughs> is Carson Palmer, and we were going to go with Matt Liner. And uh, to the point where Matt thought he was going to start, called his dad, hey, I'm going to think I'm starting Arizona. His dad gets in the car from, you know, Orange County and driving across the desert, going to get to Arizona to see the game, you know. And uh, we get off the bus at the, at the stadium, and the guys come out, and it's about 105, you know. And the guys come dragging out, you know, and they're walking slow, and they're sitting down on the bench. Nobody's got any juice at all. Guys are just kind of worn out from the trip, feeling the heat. And I look around, and I'm freaking scared to death. I'm saying, we're going to go into this game and look at our energy, look, look at what we got going. So we corral the guys, get them going, try to get something going to get the normal workout done uh, to, to get through it. We get back on the, on the bus, get back to the hotel, and I, I get all the coaches to come to my room, and I said, and I got everybody in, this, in, in my bedroom, and I said, listen, tonight is, is the challenge night of all time for us. I said, we have, to, we have to conjure up an energy and a juice for these guys to play this football game, and we don't have a chance, and we may never win again. So no matter what you have to say, I want every single one of you guys to bring it to tears tonight when you're talking to the team. I don't care if you're thinking about the dog that died when you were a six-year-old kid or make something up or, or put some onions in your eyes or whatever. You need to <laughs> bring it to tears. I want to see your heart and soul, everything you got in this meeting because we we've got to capture these guys. We don't have a chance. So I mean, some of the worst stories you've ever heard are told that <laughs> you know? And then there, were, there I was, you know, I was, my mom was kicking the dog and, you know, and it, it just, it, but it didn't matter. We were just trying to grab them, you know. And so I decided that there's no way we're going to change, you know. So I, I called Matt up to my room after the meeting and said, Matt, you know, Carson's going to start, you know. And, and uh, he said, what am I going to tell my dad? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, can't, I can't help you on that one, you know. And so uh, fortunately we stayed with Carson, which obviously he becomes the number one player in the draft after next year's, you know, and the Heisman Trophy winner and all that kind of stuff. So we almost screwed that up. But uh, in the game, in the game in particular, we were ahead. Like, we'd been ahead in, in other couple games er earlier in the year, and we had lost leads at the end of the game. And there was one, we were ahead by about, I don't know, 12 points or something like that. And Arizona was coming back, and we could kind of feel the momentum shift. And here it is, it's the, and it's start early in the, in the fourth quarter. And they throw a pass, and, and our graduate assistant coach that's on our team now, Chris Richard, picks the ball off on the sidelines and runs it back about 60 yards for a touchdown and scores a touchdown. And that was the play we needed to show we could make a play when you could feel the momentum shift, the plays that you make to finish off and win football games. So we go into the locker room, in this crappy little locker room they have, and we squish all in there. And, and, uh, and I told the guys the other night, I said, I said, we do not have to lose anymore. We do not have to lose any more football games. We're on our way. This is it. We've made the, we've made the transition. And I was <laughs> preaching and coaching and dreaming and hoping at the time, you know. But it was, this was the moment that we could capture if we would all agree to it that no longer do we have to go into games and lose games and give them away like had been happening for years, right? And, uh, you know, we've won a lot of games since that, you know. Sure have. <laughs> I mean, that's, you take off five of them, you know. Uh, and we were two and five, three and five after that one. So that was a, it's been a pretty significant uh, moment. You, t you talked about looking at your team's energy. Can you tell now, when you look at when they break the tunnel, can you tell now in the locker room whether they've got it or not? Not necessarily. Not as much as you would think. Um, you, know, you, uh, you have sense, you know. Uh, and you have to fight off, you know, your, you know the, the concerns that you have that can kind of conjure what you're seeing, you know. You look at the wrong couple guys, you know, and, but here's the guys that are really going to do all the playing, but you're worried about these guys, you know. So you, you, I don't really have that down to a science where I know, you know. Uh, the, but what is powerful for our program is we go into every game knowing that we're going to win. You know, that's a whole thing that we work at, at orchestrating that we can talk about if you want to, but that's a whole different way of looking at things. And so I'm not a guy that's paranoid. You know, I don't go into our, our challenges or our games with the mindset that something bad's going to happen. I mean, I live my whole life thinking something good is just about to happen. That's what being ADD is all about as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know anybody else out there with ADD? I mean, you never get bored, you know. <laughs> it's easy. Something's always happening, you know, so I kind of live that way. Feel the same way, just get distracted by shiny objects all yeah, the time. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's talk about, uh, you know, th these are rough waters, a rough economy, and uh, sometimes you got to come back from adversity. So we'll talk about a little bit of the adversity since uh, you've experienced some interesting uh, uh, setbacks. So um, you've been in coaching for 30 years now, hard to believe, 30 years. You were uh, one of the youngest coaches when uh, you became the head coach for the Jets. Uh, first year, you go 6 and 10? Yeah, I, six and I, ten. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna, and, and I, <laughs> you can tell him how you started, but how you finished. You finished six and ten, 
and after one season, you're fired. <coughs> Matter of fact, Boomer Esiason was here today on uh, campus. Is that right? Yeah, he was, yeah. was he but your quarterback? He, he was our quarterback. I don't know if you remember Boomer Esiason, one of the all-time greats, you know, in the, in the league. <coughs> we had him in his last couple of years, and he would, happened to be visiting today with his daughter seeing campus. So uh, we had to revisit. <laughs> Does anyone hear the story real quick? Well, can we tell that in a second? Sure. Let's, let's tell sure. this one first. So, you want. so, <laughs> you're, you're how you get. How did you get that news after one year of coaching? You got this great job, and you're terminated after one year. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, my uh, my counselor tells me it's good to talk about this every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Breathe, just, breathe. Just to keep things, you know, kind of on the yeah. on, on the humble side. No, the uh, yeah, I'm going to tell the whole story. Forget, to, I'll get to that in a second. We're six and five. <laughs> <laughs> six and five. We're playing the Miami Dolphins at the Meadowlands, and. Uh, we're playing for first place. This is going into week 12. Season 16 games, right? Okay, during the season. Week 12, we're playing for first place against the Dolphins. We're, we're, we're vying for it. We, we have a tremendous first three quarters. We play a heck of a start to the game. And sure enough, Boomer throws a pick over here, run back for a touchdown, another pick, set up. And, and if you all, any of you that are NFL uh, kind of enthusiasts know that there was a game when Dan Marino faked the spike and then threw the touchdown, that was my game. <laughs> <laughs> the, the clock's running down, time's running out. With, you've seen the quarterback, anybody that watches football, he throws the ball down to stop the clock and then they go back and huddle. Well, Marino pumped it to the ground and then threw the and faked like he was going to stop the clock and threw the ball to a guy in the, in the corner of the end zone for the winning touchdown. Well, that was like one of the, it's one of the big moments in the history of, of NFL football and comebacks and stuff like that, and that was my game. We went on, after that loss, we, we lost the next four games and I got fired right after. <laughs> <laughs> so. So uh, Boomer and I did have to revisit that today <laughs> because he was part of that. But uh, anyway, so w what happened was um, we were about a week, a week into the off season, the game the season was over, and uh, you know we're working on assessing the season and working on you know the personnel situations. And the, it was right at the time the cap had just ki kicked in. It was the first year of the, of the official NFL cap, you know, for the salaries and all salary cap. And uh, I got to knock my door, and, 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 and one of the guys around the office said. Uh, you got to go down to the general manager's office. So I, I, Dick Steinberg was the general manager at the time, guy I really liked and thought a lot of and, and was close to. And, and so I walk in the office and I see Dick sitting over here at the front of the office. And he's, like, he's got his head down. And I look over and there's a, there's a chair and with, with the owner, Leon Hess, and another chair sitting right there, kind of, you know, well, obviously that's where I'm supposed to sit, you know. <laughs> and so I go walking in and there was just, you know, Dick wasn't looking at me and, and here's the owner, which I've talked to like twice in the five years I've been there. And uh, he didn't hire me, wasn't there for the hiring, any of that. And I thought, hmm, this is going to be interesting, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I have no idea what's going to happen there. And the first thing he said to me is, well, uh, well, Pete, a uh, man in your situation in the business world would uh, resign. But uh, I know you're probably not going to do that, so uh, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> so in that moment, I'm looking right at Leon Hess. Now, Leon Hess is about 77 or 8 years old at the time. Multi-billionaire, made his whole fortune selling sludge oil, the oil that nobody wanted. He picked up, threw it in barrels, and, and created a, a you know, billion, multi-billionaire type business in this thing. Hard, gritty, tough guy. And he just told me I'm fired, and I thought I'm looking right in the, between the eyes of the devil. <laughs> 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 and it was just like that moment, wow, you know. And then my next, uh, you, you're, you're Leon right now. <laughs> And then the very, the very next thought I had was, this is the most awesome thing I could ever imagine. I got four years left of my contract, and I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. And so, uh, you know, obviously, you, know, you shake hands and you walk out. That's it, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so the first thought I had, really, as soon as it happened, other than the devil thought, was that this was an unbelievable opportunity for me. I couldn't even fathom all of the things that were, you know, at my fingertips right now. And, and uh and uh, you know that was that was the start of you know my first major public sh swing. You know, <laughs> so you tend to be an optimist. Yeah, <laughs> good trait for an entrepreneur as well. Well, then you you go on in New England. You uh, you're the head coach at the, the Patriots for three years. You take them to the playoffs two of the three years. Again, <coughs> after the third year, another talk is coming, and after only three years, you're terminated. What happened there? And Sort of what what uh, was the situation in New England, well, and why didn't it work? Th that was w uh, much more difficult than and, than the other one was because I had been named like the interim head coach, you know, and took over and uh, you know or kind of took over in the middle of a, of a run of guys and friends of mine. It was just a different situation, knew the people and all. Um, I'd gone to San Francisco for two years at the Niners, and then got the job uh, 
Um, the year that New England played the Packers in the, the New Orleans Super Bowl, the one where uh, Brett Favre's running around with his helmet over his head, remember? You guys all know that, uh, the iconic picture? Yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's that game. The next you know, couple days later, I'm the head coach at, for the Patriots. And, uh, you know, we had done all, all right. You know, I was wound up 27 and 21, you know. We'd won a lot of games and done well. We'd won the division the first year and, and got the place the second year. Then the third year, we are struggling. Owner was building a... Uh, was in the process of building a new stadium, had a lot of pressure on him, was trying to get the money from the state of Massachusetts. If you remember, he promised that they were going to build the stadium in Connecticut. You don't know this, but in Hartford. And on the steps of the, 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 you know, the Hartford, Connecticut uh, state capitol, you know, we're coming to Connecticut and all that kind of stuff. And he knew he wasn't going there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it almost killed him. And uh, so as the season went on, there was a lot of pressure on it. And we wind up with seven and eight going into the last game. And we were just beat to crap, you know, going into this last week. We didn't have the quarterback, didn't have a tailback, all kinds of problems. And, uh, and I knew it was coming. You know, I could tell it was coming. And, and so um, in the build-up, it was a home game. And, and I got Robert Kraft to come into my office and close the door. And I said, look, this is the last game that we're, we're likely working together. I need to know what's going on. Tell me. Tell me if it's up because give me that so that I can enjoy this day. And he, you know, it was it was a very emotional setting because I really liked the guy and he liked me and all, but he had, you know, we had to do it. He had to do it. And so, uh, um, one of the great spite games of all, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I get fired right then and he promised me not to say anything to anybody because he had promised his kids he wouldn't tell anybody until after the game and all that. But I knew and so it was one of the great wins. We beat the, the Ravens. The Ravens had won six in a row and uh, with just an unbelievable win and, uh, and then I'm, I'm done, you know. And uh, at the time, w there was so much turmoil in our, in our front office and from the ownership and from the head coach. There were so many issues about how we were to run the program and who was in charge and all that kind of stuff that it had not run smoothly and it had not been um, anywhere near the dream I had in my mind of how it would be coming after the, the, the New York situation, going to San Francisco, learning all the stuff from George Seifert and Bill, Bill Walsh and ready to go. And it didn't. And he said, "I want to run the organization just like he did at San Francisco." And it took me about three days to realize that he wasn't. He couldn't do it. And so everything kind of, you know, deteriorated. And, but we were still making it. And so it was a very trying time, you know. And, and when it ended, uh, I, I knew that I hadn't been able to, you know, really carry out the whole approach and the philosophy and the mentality that I wanted to convey in this situation, which I was totally unprepared for at the Jets. And uh, and so as I'm fired, you know. You have to go face the media and you have to face, you know, this is huge when this happens. I mean, it is a total shock to the system and, 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 and your family and everybody. Uh, but I, I, I didn't sanction the decision. I didn't sanction the guy that made the call. And as I didn't sanction it when Leon Hess did it, because I knew he was just getting started and all of that, that didn't even, I didn't even waver, you know. And when this one happened, I, I re clearly recall this most difficult media in Boston. I mean, you can't even imagine how difficult it is relative to here anywhere other than Philadelphia. It's the worst. And uh, <laughs> to go down the row, the press row, and, and, and shake hands with all those guys and say, see you later, to guys that had, you know, some guys had tried to vilify me and the whole thing, and some guys weren't, you know, some guys were, you know, were different. But to go through that, and re I remembered that every hand that I shook, I was able to feel like, you know, you know I'm going to see you guys again now. You know, we're going to do something, you know, this ain't over yet. And, and uh, it didn't hit me. It didn't, it didn't, it, it would hurt, but it didn't kill me, you know. And so uh, um, I came out of there with a resolve, and, and in the next 10 months led up to this, you know, this opportunity here. But I came out of there with a resolve that I didn't accept the fact that I failed it. And so w with that thought, I was really able to handle anything from that point forward. That's what SC got. Got this hardened, you know, uh, uh, you know, exposed, I've already been dead but not, you know, right. kind of um, you know, guy coming into the program, and I was so ready for this, this, this has been easy in, in comparison. <coughs> did you feel, well, I was going to ask you, did you feel whether you had two strikes? When okay, you that's as low as we're getting for the yeah. night, okay? Yeah, <laughs> All right. yeah. The rest of this is the arc of the story, here it comes, right now we're coming back up and here it comes. Um, <laughs> hey, you, you followed a coach in Bill Parcells that was very different uh, in his style, he's not the prototypical coach, you know, stomping up and down, berating players. One, before we talk about your style, can you, you talk about how you were greeted in Boston compared to Bill Parcells? I mean, everyone knows, if everyone knows Bill Parcells, he is, you know, right out of central casting, you know, yelling at players, berating them, and uh, not probably the same image you'd, you'd have of, of Pete. So how did the media treat you versus, versus uh, Bill well, Parcells? Well, just to give you an illustration, in the first day we're going to camp, uh, in our first, you know, fall camp going, uh, 
the picture in the in the uh, the Boston Globe, had one of those caricature types, you know, they had the picture of Bill Par Parcells with pearl-handled pistols in his best pose, looking like, uh, you know, what's the guy? Clint Eastwood, or or whatever, you know. Uh, <laughs> and they have Pete with it, one hand over the surfboard and a, and a glass of wine in sandals and shorts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's like the sushi kid versus Attila the Hun, you know. <laughs> so, so right off the bat, they kind of had me as, as the California guy. He's from New Jersey. And he winds up being like the NFL coach of the decade, you know, you know when they go back and, and vote him in. I mean, he was awesome. And uh, so, but I, th I, th I thought that was extraordinary for me going in. I, mean, I thought this is, this is as good as it can get. He's so far I in his direction, and I have a total different way of doing things, that the change might be received because he left the team with issues, you know, he didn't fly back with him after the last game. Remember, there was all kinds of abandonment thoughts, and the the the, the almost uh, you know abusive dad, you know, had abandoned the, the, his children, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I was coming in to save the day, <laughs> 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 and uh, so it, it was. But it was most difficult because he was such a powerful, charismatic figure that it was it was. Most coaches with great experience would say, I ain't following him, <laughs> you know, yeah. because of the, the impact that he leaves and the impression that he leaves. And, you know, I, I went the other way. I thought this was, you know, the chance of a lifetime. Of course, I went the other way about it. So. Well, let's, let's talk about your style because it is very unlike a, a lot of coaches in the NFL. How, you know, we, when we start businesses, we talk about core philosophy, core values, <coughs> and building your company on that. And those, those are things that, you know, don't get enough attention sometimes when you start a business or, or you run a team. What do you set as your core values, your philosophy, and can you take us through your leadership style? Let me start this way. Um, let me ask you guys a question. Um, how many of, of you out there, well, let me say this first. Does everybody really feel like they've won pretty much in their lifetime? You kind of win, kinda, things are going pretty good. Do you kind of feel like that? Yeah. Okay, well, raise your hand if you feel like you're, you're a winner. Ra come on, raise your hand. <laughs> uh, oh, I, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Somebody did it. Well, well, really, you know, y'all can win, and we, we win by, by doing good things, and every now and then uh, things come together, and sometimes you have some years, or maybe even a couple years in a row, where you had really successful years, and you really felt like you were on your game, and things were going well. Well, and then things changed, and they weren't quite as good, probably. And, you know, but if you had your way, wouldn't you really choose, like, to win from now on and actually just kind of win forever? Huh? <laughs> can we raise your hand to that one? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, right. Same guy back there. My <laughs> God. <laughs> well, let me, let me say this to you. That you have proven in your own lifetime that you know how to be successful and win. Well, we all have done that. But we really, you want to win over a long period of time, which is really the vision for our program. We want to win forever. I mean, from now on. I know better than with all that we've done that it's... You can't win every single game forever. Now, we went for a while now, and we fooled them. We have 30-something, whatever it was, games. We showed that you can go for a real long time, but it's really difficult to win every single game. And winning forever isn't about that. Winning forever is about maximizing your potential, finding out how good you could possibly become, and then, and then holding on to that vision, having a clear thought of what that is, and work until you create that. You will not back off until that happens, and, until that manifests right before your eyes. Well, that, that's... That's a way we look at it. Cause that, that's, a, that's in, in essence, a philosophy for us. Let me ask you this. Uh, you, everybody out here, you know, high class students at USC, kicking butt in the Marshall School, all that. raise your hand if you have a philosophy. Raise your hand. Look around. Look around. See how many hands there? Okay, now, okay, put your hands down. Okay, now, of those people that just raised their hands, how many of you can uh, stand up right now with, in 25 words or less and tell me what that philosophy is? Raise your hand. Look around. What just happened? There's a couple. I'm not calling on you. <laughs> <laughs> Check this out. Y'all just said that y'all want to win. You know, you, you like to win forever. And you're all in this business here at SC, and you've all got your sights on being highly successful, and you're going to be that way. If you want to win for a long period of time, there's no way you have a chance of doing that if you don't know how you won sometimes. If you don't know what it took to get your game together, to get your act right, to get your mentality right, to create that that successful manner and way that you had, then how can you expect to repeat it the next year and the next year and the next year? And it's so obvious to me that you have to be clear about what your philosophy is, exactly what you're saying. We don't spend enough time on it? Yeah, no kidding. We don't spend anywhere near the time on it. It is what I spend all my time on, is helping people understand that, that you do have a philosophy. You just don't know it. 
And you don't, and I'm saying that to you because you're acting. You got, you got a world, you got a life, you got a way you're working, the guys that are in business already, you're already doing it. You just don't know what it is. And think about this. If you're going to be successful, don't the people around you have to be successful pretty much also, those that support you? Well, if you are a business owner and the people around you are unable to know what your philosophy is, how could they possibly act in accordance with what you think is important? If you don't know what it is, how can they know what it is? Are they supposed to figure it out? That ain't competing. <laughs> That's just leaving it up to chance. You need to know your philosophy so clearly that you can convey it on a regular basis so the people around you can act in accordance with that philosophy. That's, you need to know it so clearly that they live it along with you. If you don't know it, you're not even sure if you're living it or not. If you don't know it, you don't know when you're not living your philosophy. You're not acting in accordance with the way you want to operate. <laughs> this is, of all of the things, it is the most important issue. You've got to figure yourself out. You've got to figure out what is important to you. If you could get it done in your class, you're probably the only teacher in this university that's doing that. You have to figure it out. I was fortunate enough, and I'm, I speak so strongly about this because I did figure it out. And I, I was smacked right between the eyes with it when I was reading Coach John Wooden, the basketball coach from the other school, <laughs> his book, and it said, and I had known his history, I'd grown up in California, but after his 16th year at UCLA, he won his first national championship. I slammed the book, <laughs> shut right down, holy shit. Because I knew the rest of the story. He won 10 of the next 11 national championships at UCLA. After he, this is how I interpret it, he figured it out. He knew what it took, finally, after 20, 30-something years of coaching, 16 years at UCLA, winning conference championships, having success, he finally figured it out so well that nobody could touch him for 11 years, and then he quit. He retired. One game, one year, somebody beat him, or he'd have won 11 straight. That's how powerful it is to know how, what you're all about. It didn't matter what decade he was coaching and what coaches he had or what players he had. It, it, it was him. He knew it, and he could get people to operate in accordance with that philosophy because he knew it so well. Any of you ever read or study about him, just take a little bit of time. You're going to realize this guy, is, he's got this way of thinking that's uh, it's just extraordinary. It's unique. It isn't me. I couldn't do him. I never wanted to. I just needed to figure out my own philosophy, and you do too. You have to work at this. As you're young and you're just starting, there's no way you're, it's going to be the philosophy you're going to wind up with most likely. But the essence of it's already there. Who you are is already in there. You need to figure it out. So that when you come to your competitive world, which I kind of think it's all of your world, but when you come to your competitive world in your business, or if you want to be a really good dad, you need a philosophy. If you want to be a really good mom, you want to be a good husband, you want to be a good friend to your friends, you want to be a great corporate leader, you need to know who the heck you are and what you're all about. You need to know what you think about it. That's, that's what the essence is and uh, of, of setting yourself up so that you have a chance. You're going to screw it up. You're going to make mistakes. You've got to assume other people's ideas until you get your own, but you have to ask yourself the serious questions to figure it out. Now, I'll take it one step further. The step further is, as soon as I slammed that book closed, I was living up in New England, and I would, I'd been about six years uh, six months of in, in retirement. And I said, it took him 16 years. The next job I get, I might not get 16 months. <laughs> I better get my act together. So what I did is I just, I couldn't wait. I just started writing everything I could think of about the job of being a football coach. And every single little issue that I could think of that you could make a decision on, I made a decision on. And I wrote it down. And I, it just, it, I, it, this took me weeks to get through everything I could think of. I just kept leaving notes to myself. Don't forget to you know, come to an agreement with yourself about this, 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 and this. And out of that came, wow, I'm a competitor. Shoot, I compete at everything I do. I've been doing it my whole life. You know, that's how I've lived. You know, I, wanna, I don't want to just do well in football or as a football coach or as a dad. Or, shoot, I, I want to kick ass right now tonight for you guys. I don't know any other way to think. Well. Well, if that's the facts, which I, I agreed with myself, that there is some talking with me <laughs> <laughs> that took place. That that needed to be the central theme in our program, competition. Going to do things better than it's ever been done before, it popped out of that. Our, our football philosophy, when I talk to the football players, they don't hear all the stuff I'm telling you. They see it. They live it with me. But the football philosophy, it's all about the ball. That was in, that has, it's a whole concept about turnovers and how we win football games. The best, it's the most important issue in, in coaching football to me. You know, all of these things, our style, 
We play with great effort, great enthusiasm, we play smart. All of the things, our three rules, on and on and on, all of the things that have become so central to our program came out of that next couple of weeks writing down stuff right then. And I haven't changed since. I really haven't altered. I've just gotten better at it, getting better at teaching the message. Because what I have to do as the leader is to teach my coaches first so that they can live it and they can exude all of the mentality, be disciples, and, and pass it on down through the players so that we can have a mentality and a conscience a way of operating that separates us so that we're not, like Jerry Garcia said a long time ago, we don't want to be the best ones doing something. We want to be the only ones doing it. I like that thought. I like that <laughs> thought. Get yourself your own way, your own style, and then separate from the rest and leave them behind and never look back is really how, we, how we've done it. And <laughs> Great advice. Um, <laughs> and drilling it down to communicating to your coaches and your team, What's the role of empowerment and authenticity and all the other th sort of sub-philosophies that fall under that? How do you communicate it and, and, and <coughs> convey and translate that enthusiasm? The structure, of it, the structure of it is pretty simple to me. Uh, the, the foundation of what we're all about is, is our beliefs, the things that we believe in. The, and what I refer to it as the belief system. All of the different things that you would believe, that you, that you feel strongly about, really are fall into this system of those beliefs that, to me, out comes your philosophy. If you go through the process, your philosophy will come together. We're going to do things better than it's ever been done before. That's it. That's really how we operate here. The, the, the job is to convey that message and, and, and get it across. So I constructed, I came up with a way to construct a little, little pyramid thing to teach it. Foundation was philosophy. Next step was the central theme in the program is competition. The next aspect of it is, is that practice is everything, which we can go into if you want to, but we don't need to. Practice is everything. And, and, and we have learned and we have taught our coaches and our players that through practice, that this is the aspect of what we do that allows us to make ourselves. This is where we create who we are. This is where we build the skills and the attitude and the mindset and the mentality that it takes to operate and perform like we're capable of performing. Well, through this process, you talked about empowerment. The whole thing is built on empowering the individual to realize how good they are and what they're capable of doing. See, to me, to empower somebody is to spend time with, with uh, our, our guy Leon Hess here, and, and <laughs> you and I are going to come to an agreement of what you're capable of, of becoming. We're going to dig into it so we can talk about it, we can feel it. I'm going to get you to agree on, uh, on what you, you, can, uh, you can create. Once we've created that vision, I am backing off. I'm going to be the one that's not backing off. I'm going to stay with you and keep you disciplined to stay in connection with that which you can become until, we, until I can say, see, there you are. That's what we're talking about. With one person, whether it's the coach or the trainer or the, the secretary upstairs or the entire football team, it is exactly the same approach. It's about creating a vision for what you can become and uh, coming to that agreement and then not backing off, living that, that vision into, until it becomes a reality. And I didn't know it at the time, but how, how many of <coughs> you heard of The Secret? Have you guys heard of The Secret, you know, that, that thing from Oprah and all those guys and Doug, <laughs> Michael Beckwith and all? Well, The Secret is, is, is a book that's, that's written, that's based on a principle called the law of attraction. What you focus on, you draw to yourself. Let me give you an illustration of how powerful that is. It, they refer to it as one of the laws of the universe. And, and I didn't know that there was a secret about that thing, <laughs> you know. And I didn't know that, but we were living this way. I've been kind of in this mentality for a long time. Well, let me give you an illustration. Now, we do some work in the streets, and we do some, you know, some cool things here in our community. And if you talk to kids in the community here in, in L.A. or any of the cities in, in, in the United States, I'm sure, and around the world, you ask them, what, what's your life all about? What, what's, what's going on in your world? As well, I'm either going to die or I'm going to jail. That's their vision. And you know what? They're right. They're going to absolutely create <coughs> exactly. That is such a powerful, iconic vision for them. That's what's going to happen. And th there's not anything you can do for that person as long as they hold on to that vision. Obviously, the work is to give them hope to create a vision that can take them somewhere else. That's the lowest end. I mean, you're going to die or you're going to jail. That's how our kids live. What do you think? It, why there's 70% of the kids all wind up in jail? And then they get kicked back out and they wind up going back on and on. That's how powerful this message is. Well, in this, this program, you know, you take us back. What, what's our vision? We'll win forever. Has no end. You don't ever know when you get there. You just keep on going. <laughs> you just keep on aspiring. You just keep on. Is, is, is you know, seven championships enough? Hmm. The 
first day I went to the New England Patriots, the first day I visited with, it, with that football team, I said, okay, raise your hands. How many of you guys think the greatest thing in the world is to win the, the, uh, the World Championship and win that Super Bowl? Well, now, they had just lost, right, a couple weeks ago. Every guy in the room raised his hand. I said, really? Well, how many of you guys in here think winning two back-to-back -back is, is maybe the greatest thing in the world? And, you know, they didn't know what I was talking about. They didn't understand because the they could only think about winning one time. They never thought about winning twice or three times. Or how many is enough for you guys is really the question. How broad, how, how, how expansive can you, can you think? Can you, can you expand your, your, you know, the vision for what you can create? You know, that, that's, that's what we've done here. And by doing so, I, I think that is all about empowerment. It's all about helping individuals and groups see what they could possibly become and then put them on course and orchestrate it. Let me back up one more thing here and I'll shut up <laughs> until the next question. Um, <laughs> remember I said about practice is where you make yourself? It's where you make, you make who you are as a team. It's, if you're in business, it's how you prepare, how you, you know, make your products, how you prepare your, you know, whatever you are you, that you represent, it, it, I guess. I guess that's the analogy. Well, in, in when you practice really, really hard and really, really well, what the, the byproduct of that is if, if the coaches will allow the players to understand that, that they deserve to be confident, show them. Look how good you are. Look what you're capable of doing. Think of all the myriad of situations we put you in, all the contingency plan to prove to you that not only are you really good, but you can play against these guys across from you who you know are great, and you can be successful against these guys because we compete so much on our practice field. To get them to the point where they feel, yeah, I can, okay, I can do this. The next step is, is to prove to them, and again, we're orchestrating, they're so good around you, the scheme is so well, we've practiced so hard, why, you can't do anything but trust that they know what they're doing too, right? You prove it to them. You prove that they should be confident, you, true that you prove that they're worthy of trusting, and from that comes this mindset that allows you to focus to the point where you're not worried about anything getting in the way. You play, in essence, in the absence of fear, as opposed to thinking what could go wrong, or maybe I'm not ready, or boy, they're so good. It has nothing to do with anybody else. It has to do with yourself. You make who you are, and we empower our individuals and our team to know that they should be confident, to know that they should trust, and to allow them to focus so that when it comes time to play, we know we're going to win. That's the whole deal. Great philosophy. I, I would not want to go against you in the living room, that's for sure. Um, I had a friend la last year, a friend from Notre Dame, was actually promised that he'd, I'd never uh, send this email around, but after he heard you speak, he's, a, he's like a trustee at Notre Dame, and he's, <laughs> I won't mention his name, but he wrote an email to Charlie? Me. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. I felt like sending it to him, but I, I said, uh, he sent me an email, he says, do not send this to anybody, but after hearing him speak, I immediately called five of my friends from Notre Dame and said, we are never going to beat them as long as he is there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about that. We only want to beat them one more time. Now, I reminded him of that today because he sent me a smart-ass email from Hawaii saying he was checking up on future recruits and say hello to you-know-who. So uh, I, I said, uh, this email is about if to go to really the... If he does that, let me know, because that's illegal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, told him that, I told him his email was going to the Notre Dame Alumni Association right now. But uh, let's, we, let's talk about pitch. These guys, uh, the entrepreneur students in the classroom, uh, next week is their elevator pitch competition. So they have to get up in front of the class, in front of a, a group of judges, and do 60 <coughs> to 90 seconds of their business, their concept, the benefits, how they solve it, what makes them different, more compelling, unique. Um, it's a lot of fun. And to see you and your recruiting classes over the, the years you've been here, I suspect you've got a pretty good pitch. <laughs> Now, I know you don't like the I'm 60 to 90 we, seconds. I'm I know tell you that we don't have a pitch, yeah. but, the, but I understand what you're asking. Me. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, you, you know you're in, I'm going to put you in the living room, but it's not going to be me because, you know, everyone knows I've only got one year of eligibility left and I'm already. You wouldn't hit the water if you fell out of a <laughs> boat. <laughs> you know, he knows that I go over the middle and I don't care if I get hit or not. I will go for it. Um, let's see, who, uh, who could be a good recruiter? Who's, who's in high school maybe? Deciding on colleges. Warren. Warren, you're, come on up. Come on up. Is this, is this Warren from Crenshaw? Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. Oh, I've heard uh -oh. about him. Uh-oh. I've heard about Warren. So, so, Warren, come on up here. Have you met Coach? How you doing, Warren? Coach Carroll, how you doing, buddy? Nice to you. Thanks to have, nice to have a chance have to a talk to you. Come on, have a seat. Have a seat here. Have a seat here. Here's, I'll give this setup. 
All right. Good. <laughs> Don't get too comfortable, Warren. <laughs> All right. So Warren is a star business student at Crenshaw High School, and I met him through Junior Achievement at uh, the c for c Gala this week. On fire, he's got business, doing some new things. He's deciding about where to go to school. He's got an opportunity to play football, even though your business talents far exceed your, your athletic talents. <laughs> How do you approach this and tell us why Warren should come to USC and play for you? I'm going to restructure it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever talk that way. I'm not talking about playing for me, so we understand that from the get-go. And uh, our process, let me just give you a shot here. Our process of recruiting uh, athletes is over a long period of time, and there is no one pitch that makes sense to me. There's a, it's all of the body of work that you spend, the time you spend with guys. However, this is closing night. It's the night before signing date. If I could be in your living room, he, he, here's what I would want you to understand. For years here at the University of Southern California, uh, this university has stood uh, as an extraordinary example in our community uh, of, of leadership. Uh, it's, it's been um, a, a place where people have come to create dreams and, and careers that, uh, that you know, they're, they spend a whole lifetime hoping for, and it happens right from this place w in many aspects of it. Now, I know you're a tremendous business student. The fact that you got a 3.8 GPA and you, you scored 1,800 on the SATs, and uh, you know, that's, that, that goes along with so. Academics tonight is not really the big issue for me because I know you're going to be a great, successful student. But I've seen you play the game. I've seen, I've seen what you can do. And as we've talked through this process all along, I've talked about what you can do as you enter this football program. Now, you know that there's been great players that come before you. There's been Reggie Bush and Matt Leonard and Joe McKnight and all the great ones that have been here before, Heisman Trophy winners, national champions, and all of that. To me, none of that matters. None of that has anything to do with you. What this all, whole opportunity of coming to USC is about is about what you can create, what you can become as a football player and as a student athlete here. I know the academic thing is going to go well, but what I want you to understand is that this is it, this is maybe uh, the best chance you could ever have to realize your dreams as a player. Because what I'm going to do with you in this program is come to an agreement of what you're all about. What do you want to create? What what can you possibly accomplish? And I'm not going to back off. I'm going to outcompete you like you can't imagine. I'm never going to let up on you. I'm never going to give you a way out of becoming what you're capable of becoming. We're going to talk about it. We're going to spend time. I'm going to show you pictures of it. I'm going to show you film. I'm going to show you on the practice field. I'm going to put you up against the best athletes in America day in and day out. And we're going to make everything you can become on this practice field. It, it, it's, it's a simple formula. All you have to do is work really hard. At any time, if anything gets in the way of you working really hard, whether you're a kid in high school, whether you're a Pop Warner kid or playing for the NFL, it doesn't matter. It's about giving everything you got. The rules in the program are simple. You got to give us great effort. You got to play with great enthusiasm. You got to play smart. You stay with that and you follow us along, then we'll create this vision together. There ain't any doubt. I know it's going to happen. I've watched it before and I can't wait to see it. The family, People from the neighborhood, people from your school, from Crenshaw, Coach Garrett on down. You know, I don't care about you. Don't know, remember Lee Webb? <laughs> you don't remember old Lee Webb? He's the last guy that came from Crenshaw. It's about time. It's about time you're the next one to come with us. So I hope that uh, we'll do this together. With the championships, the, the trophies, all that kind of stuff. We ain't worrying about that. We want to make you the best you can possibly become. Come on down to USC. <laughs> Hold on, not, not so fast. Not, you can take that off. <laughs> you know? You look pretty good in that helmet, that one. <laughs> you know, Coach, I've sat by year after year and watched you take some of our best players away from the business school and bring them on the football team. <laughs> this one's just too valuable. I can't let you steal Warren. So, you like to compete? Let's compete. You ready? Okay. All right. Let me tell you why you should be at USC, but over on that side of the campus, <laughs> at the Marshall School. At the Greif Center, as Coach said, it's an incredible time to be at USC. Students are starting businesses in every type of business imaginable. They're going out and killing it. You want to talk about coaches? Let's talk about professors. 
We've got some of the experts in the field here. Some of them are here. I see Tom Knapp. I see Albert Napoli. I see Chris Harr. I see Patrick Henry. Where are your position coaches? Mine are here. They're <laughs> out recruiting right, right now. Matter of fact, they're recruiting his offensive line. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> These guys love what they do. They're so committed to this. Tom Knapp. Where's Tom Knapp? Where is he? That guy's got a business incubator over his garage just for students. This guy is committed. You want to talk about Heisman's? You want to talk about Heisman's? They've got Palmer, Leinert, Bush. We've got Heisman's too. They're called MySpace, Salesforce.com, Kinko's. <laughs> this is the place of champions. Uh, he's, starting, he's starting to waver, but he, you don't know that he and I Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> I know, you, I know you dream big dreams, huge, audacious dreams, dreams that you don't even share with your family or friends. We're here to help make those dreams come true. Go with Coach, you're going to have an amazing, amazing four years. Best experience of your life. How, how do you turn it down? I, you know what? I'd sign up to play for him, and I'm, I'm going on 40. <laughs> 45, but 40. <laughs> but Warren, you don't want to play for an NFL team. You want to own an NFL team. <laughs> and, the, and the stadium, all right? So go back to school, keep your grades up, crush the SATs, get into school, and come join the Greif Center and the Marshall School, and we'll help you make it happen. What do you say? Proposition for me. I'll come to the. I'll come. I'll play for you guys. I'll follow your whole formula, your whole policy, on one condition. You have to give me time to make sure I keep up with my grades and my classes. And you have to let me attend the Marshall School. There you go. Yeah. Put it on. Put it on. Yeah. Yeah. Warren. Warren Jones. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. Excuse me. <laughs> He, he, did, he did say as he was walking out right there that you promised him he's going to get all A's, so that means you're... Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't have the same recruiting book that you do. Right. <laughs> called Compliance. Yeah, yeah, that may have been a violation as far as I know. Um, well, let's, we like to have fun here. Let's talk about the role of fun and humor in your program. Let's see. In the past, you've had, um, you've had Will Ferrell come in, obviously. You've had... Uh, Lendale White quit the team and hurled himself off a parking garage. <laughs> You've gotten a fight with Ricky Bobby. Yeah. Uh, I think this past year you had Captain Compete come in. Yeah, that was a big moment. Catch himself on fire and left you holding a sock, well, which was yeah, <laughs> something they remember. Yeah. Um, you've had Snoop Dogg in here. You've had Will in here. What's the role of fun and spontaneity in your program, and why is it important? You know, if we're not having fun, then I'm screwing up. You know, I mean, this is, we play the game, you know, and, and uh, um, I, I've always enjoyed the heck out of it. I don't ever dread any aspect of it. I don't want our players to, to see it in that light. I want them to enjoy um, every moment that we have in, in some way, and in, 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 in many ways, I guess. And in that, um, I want to give them the opportunity to, to do things and share experiences that they only get to share themselves. Um, there's, a, there's a process of bonding that, that, that teams go through and sometimes they do it well and sometimes they don't and uh, that comes from the shared experiences that they have that only they have and so for the most part even though we will share our fun on the outside after the fact uh, there's times when we do things that are just unique to this experience and that nobody else can, can take part in and uh, th that that along with so many other things that go on in the program uh, is kind of like the fabric that we weave you know to uh, to create this connection that, that makes us unique and special and, and uh, gives us this special opportunity to, to really you know, experience something really out, you know, that's just off the charts. And so it's the fun and the surprises. And, and the other part of it, too, is, and, and you do a very good job of this, you know, we're teaching the entire time. You know, my guys can't get Bs. You know, <laughs> we got to get As. Okay, so uh, th there's, there's, no no curve. there's no curve <laughs> for us. And so, um, you know, I feel as, an, as, a, as the teacher, 
you know, I need to keep their attention and their focus and I need to do whatever that takes to get that done and to compete at all ends to make sure that I've got them kind of on the edge of their seat wondering what's going to happen next. And so uh, we, we operate with an extraordinarily high level of involvement in, in energy and enthusiasm and also we, we're entertaining them, you know, just as, you know, we've been doing tonight. To, to make it engaging and fun and, and thoughtful and instead of lecturing and dittos and that kind of stuff, you know, and go read the book, you know, that kind of thing. You know, we, we can't operate that way. It's not, it's not competing enough. See, I, I don't need to be a great teacher. I need to have great learners. <laughs> they got to learn the stuff. Right. So whatever it takes to get that done, we have to create. And so that's in the back of my mind always to maintain a really good exchange where the learners are really actively involved in, in you know, max, maxing out. And I assume it's part of your personality. I mean, you like to have fun, and if it wasn't part of your job, it wouldn't be as much fun to be yeah, here. Yeah, all that. Well, well what's, uh, speaking of Will, what's your favorite movie or scene? Will Ferrell. Um, uh, old school, by far. Old yeah. school, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, by far. Busy day tomorrow, Bed Bath & Beyond. I don't know if I'll have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> matter Every of fact, matter of fact, for those of you that do Twitter, a little sidebar here, uh, you know, we're, we're almost in the closing stages of getting Will on now. Anybody His campaign. Pay, anybody paying attention? By yes. The way? Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. We're almost almost got it knocked. He had to go underground for about a week here, so that's why we haven't heard from him. But uh, <laughs> but he's, I think we, we got to we've got to knock him a couple more times to get him in the boat. So we almost got it. So connect with Coach's page on Facebook, and you'll, <coughs> you'll be uh, involved in all the, the the campaign to recruit Will Farrell to Twitter, <laughs> and and receive his twitters. Um, last question before we open it up to the students is. Um, uh, you, you talked about building um, Better LA and your involvement there. And, and a lot of the, uh, the things that make you unique as a football coach is the way you've integrated yourself into our home and, and into our, our neighborhood. Um, you could just be a hell of a football coach, and you are. And people will judge you on wins and losses, and that'd be great. Be a big part of SC. Why is it important for you to do more than that and find a way to serve others? And, and tell, tell everyone here about a Better LA. Um. Okay, uh, it, it's important to do whatever you can do because we only have so much time here, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, uh, I want to try to, you know, be as, as helpful and as compassionate and uh, as, as, I've, as time allows, you know, and, and there's a lot of time, you know, and football is a huge job. Everybody that runs their companies, they've got huge jobs, they know, and, and all that, but, um, you know, but if your heart, you know, sends you the message that there's things that you can do and, and, and <coughs> You just have to find a, an energy and a way to do it. What happened was uh, years ago, um, there was a, on Monday morning, it was Notre Dame, <coughs> as a matter of fact, I was driving in on Figueroa, and the report came on the radio that four kids or something got killed on, over the weekend. On Tuesday, there were three more kids got killed in related incidents, and then there was two more. There was 11 kids got killed by Thursday on this kind of you know, back and forth uh, interaction in the streets. And I called a friend of mine and said, uh, you know, we always talked about doing something special. This is it. We got, we got to try to save somebody, some kids' lives. This is crazy. And that's when the Better LA was born. And uh, the thought that I had right from the beginning is, is that somebody's calling these shots. Somebody in the streets or in garages or back alleys is uh, telling kids, you know, okay, we got to knock this guy off. We got to do this or whatever. You know, these guys are getting in our way. We need, you know, we need them eliminated. And there, somebody was calling the shots to tell people to kill other people, you know, and it was kids killing kids. And, uh, I thought if we could find a way to, to get to those guys, uh, we, we might be able to have a, a, a enough language and enough you know, energy to, to maybe turn one kid. And if we turned one kid and helped him help save somebody's life, then we were doing good work. And so it just started like that. And I pictured actually getting into the, the, the shot callers and, and turning them just like you turn a you know, kind of a... Uh, you know, a maverick football player in your team, and uh, I didn't know how to do it. I had no idea what it was going to take. I didn't know what I was getting into. We just started, you know, and, and uh, found out that we could, by just putting the word out, we could convene people. You know, the mayor came. The, the first meeting we had, the mayor came. Uh, um, Maxine Waters came. You know, all kinds of business guys. People started showing up just because we put the word out. And I realized that we had a, a power, you know, that, that we could exercise and, and hopefully do some good. So, um, since then, uh, that was a number of years ago, but since then, um, you know, we're rolling now. And Better LA is really part of something that's really exciting. Um, in conjunction with all that the mayor's doing and, and, and things that he's put in, in, into a play, um, you know, we're, we're right now, we have uh, 31 guys in the streets that we pay for. What, what, and how we've done, what we've done is to find workers from the community that had lived the life, 
that had been incarcerated, gang members, oh. the whole thing, and give those that have found uh, uh, maybe a sense that they could do some good and wanted to change, and give them a way to find out how they could give back in turn and change, and, and in essence, uh, create intervention workers, but we think of them, I think of them as peacekeepers, and uh, with, the, with the overall vision of creating a peace corps in our, in our inner streets, of people from the streets, from the communities, doing the work to mentor and to ta change kids in, in, in a way that nobody else can do. The really interesting thing is just in the last two years, LAPD and the, and the Sheriff's Department have thrown their hands up. They've openly said, we can't solve the problem. We've been 30-something years, 33 years, whatever, they've been arresting kids in the streets to try and solve these problems, and nothing has ever changed. The numbers were just as bad or, or, or worse than ever uh, when they made the, the declaration. And since that time, just in the last two years, if you guys have a chance to check out what the numbers are and how crime rates have shifted and how uh, you know, the, 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 the mentality is, sh is changing, there's so many people that are on board that with, with putting, bringing what they have as a special aspect to this whole effort. And it's an enormous job that it's, things are changing. And we're, we're in the middle of it right now. And so um, we're creating the academy to train. This is the first real-time ever uh, academy uh, um, sponsored by the mayor's office to uh, Jeff Carr's gang reduction uh, office. And the Better LA is, is, is not only part of that process, but also paying for a big portion of it and, and the money that we raise. And we're paying for the 31 guys we have working in the streets. And what we're doing is we've created a couple areas that are our model areas to prove that if you take, if you take the people from the streets and give them the opportunity and the tools, they can do um, remarkable things. If you think about it, what's really going on in the streets is terrorism. A few kids in an area of 12, 12 14,000 you know, sectioned area can cause a fear that everybody senses and feels. And it, it's not like there's hundreds of them. There's a few knuckleheads that have 10 or 12 guys that listen to them, and they're the who-sayers. They cause all kinds of problems and issues. So it's not hard to, to figure out how you stop that, but the police, everybody runs when they come to town. When they drive in the black and whites, everybody hauls ass and takes off. When the guys that are of the community, they can connect and communicate and have a chance to reach the kids. The kids are f scared to death. The, the, the hard line, big time gang bangers are scared to death because they don't know when they're going to get killed. They don't know where it's coming from. They just know that it's coming. And so they live in tremendous fear. And so they are vulnerable or in a sense susceptible to a, a way out. But it's, it's a very, very challenging job. And only those guys that are from the community can do it. So that's what we've centered our focus on in hopes of, last, last line here, is that the, the state and the, and the city will generate funds to pay for an a, a encompassing body of people that can do this work. And it, it can be done. We could have done it in Iraq, to tell you the truth. If we wouldn't have gone in there with the police force and did what we did, if we'd have gone in there diplomatically and found people from the community that were willing to gain, you could, you could change. It might have taken a lot longer, but who cares? How many thousands of people would not have suffered in the process, you know? So it's, it's a mentality. That's, it's not rocket <coughs> science. You just have to, you have to dig in. It's a big job. It's going to take a long time, and we've got to go to work at it. So it's uh, most exciting and most rewarding, and hopefully we can continue to do well. Oh, that's, it's, a, it's a daunting task, and it takes someone with your vision and leadership and energy to take it on because a lot of people have given up before. So hopefully all those... a very small part of this, you know, there's a lot of extraordinary people doing Absolutely. extraordinary work. Absolutely. We're just hoping to be a part and help. Well, good for you. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for leading the way. And hopefully we'll all get a chance to support Better LA.